we are ready for world-changing innovation to alter the course of business as usual. We need change-making tools and techniques to complement the 12 leverage points. And we must reach down to the most fundamental leverage points that we can to drive great change. Reversing our seven barriers, here's what change looks like at a high level. One, provide the motivation to overcome inertia. Two, enable feedback. Three, stop undue political donations. Four, make bureaucracy responsible. Five, empower those receiving feedback. Six, ensure wealth for all. Seven, embrace and enhance diversity. Following is what some details of that change could look like for you, whether you're within government, business, or acting as one person. Actions are organized into four general areas that track the 12 leverage points we looked at earlier. Evolving mindset and goals, changing the rules, improving information and feedback, and optimizing resource use. Let's imagine the commons as a shared resource to which everyone has a right. Some people think that managing the commons without state regulation or market forces is impossible. They argue that people will ruin the commons by over-consuming the shared resource, or by wrecking shared spaces with pollution and waste. This argument that people are incapable of managing shared resources for the common good without the state or market as arbiters has been dubbed the tragedy of the commons. And according to David Bollier, it's totally wrong. Bollier says that the people who argue that the commons is impossible to manage make the fundamental mistake of treating the commons as a thing with those selfish commons destroying people existing outside of it. But the commons isn't a thing. It's a process that involves everyone in the community working to share and distribute it fairly. People continually and diligently build and sustain a commons by negotiating how best to distribute the commons, creating the rules they need to manage the commons together, and building the infrastructure needed to keep the commons thriving for generations to come. What's cool is that these rules aren't coming from the outside, but are rather enhanced from inside the community. The data also shows that companies with shared employee ownership or communities like ours actually do better. There's no overgrazing, no selfishness, and no tragedy. While the commons may seem reasonable but impossible in today's world, the commons exist successfully all over the world. We can look at the Alaska Permanent Oil Fund, which, based on the rationale that the oil fields underneath Alaska are the property of the residents, has for 40 years divided oil revenues between the state's residents and a fund for future generations. Commons exist all over the internet, too, with sites such as Wikipedia providing an open platform for information transfer. The Commons has also been valuable in international development efforts in communities previously devastated by colonialism and free market capitalism. We have a dream that one day all companies will compete not only to be the best in the world, but the best for the world. Brought to you by the community of certified B Corporations. And what we realized is it was possible for purpose and profit to coexist. It was possible for businesses to be a force for good. It was possible for these companies to solve some of the world's toughest problems. And that's when it occurred to me, the question shouldn't be what, the question should be why not? Why aren't more companies doing this? An eyewear company that disrupts an industry and serves the poor. A food service company that serves over one million meals to low-income public school students every week. A manufacturer that goes green and helps workers move from welfare to a career. An online bookseller that recycles used books and funds local libraries and global literacy. An outdoor apparel company that stewards the environment. B Corp is a certification that helps consumers identify these change makers. And investors make money and make a difference. What do you think of that title, Hooked on Growth? 
Yes, I, I think it's a great title because I think we are, in a sense, hooked on growth. It's, it's something that's not really contributing any longer to our, our sustainable well-being, uh, and yet we keep pursuing that, that goal inappropriately. So I think we need to, to, uh, to get off of, of, uh, of growth, get off of, of, uh, of oil. Mm -hmm. you know, even President Bush acknowledged that we were addicted to oil. Uh, we're addicted to consumption and we're addicted to this idea of economic growth when it's no longer really contributing to our, our well-being. GDP was really a, uh, came after World War II, you know, when it was a, an attempt to try to measure uh, our, our economic activity and productivity. It was never designed as a measure of economic well-being. There are alternative measures of, of, uh, of well-being, this thing called the Genuine Progress Indicator. Actually, yeah, the GPI. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, uh, you know, it adds things like uh, the value of volunteer work and, and, uh, and household labor, which are left out of GDP. It, it accounts for the distribution of, of income uh, because that's a, a prime contributor to people's sense of well-being. You know, a dollar's worth of income to a rich person doesn't really contribute as much additional welfare as a dollar's worth of income to a poor person. And then it subtracts all of the things that shouldn't be counted as positives. The cost of crime, the cost of pollution, air and water pollution, the loss of natural capital and social capital assets. So corporations are drowning out our voices, getting what they want, and our democracy is in trouble. But we can totally save it. People are so outraged by the Supreme Court decision that a massive response is mobilizing. Such a huge problem requires a huge solution, and we've got one. A new constitutional amendment. The amendment is smart and clear. It reverses this disaster to our democracy by clarifying that the First Amendment isn't meant for for-profit corporations. I get that amending the Constitution is a big, ambitious goal, but it's not impossible. Every time huge, positive change has been made in this country, it's because people dreamed big, aimed high, and set ambitious goals. We need a new era of climate diplomacy one where climate risks are integrated into foreign policy agendas. Whether it's terrorism, whether it's climate change, transboundary rivers, desertification, none of these abide by arbitrary administrative borders. That's where diplomacy needs to help, that's where the defence community needs to help, because nation states can't solve this alone. It's very important to address climate security risks as part of instability and fragility considerations globally today because we are seeing increasing floods, droughts, extreme weather events, migration of people across borders as well as sea level rise and we're going to see increasing challenges globally. In diplomacy we need to understand how this is changing, how we interact with countries. We need to address these risks at the highest diplomatic level an era where diplomats make climate change a political priority. An era of cooperation between diplomats and other branches and levels of government, between governments and businesses, and between countries and regions. An era of a new climate for peace. To learn more about this topic, and to find recommendations for policymakers, have a look here. back to the work of Marjorie Kelly in her book, uh, The Divine Right of Capital, it very much started raising that question for all of us. Why is it that it's the investors, that is the owners, as it were, of a company, the ones that get to make decisions that affect a lot of uh, other groups of stakeholders? Why them? It's in case, in, uh, in case law in the United States, but it's not a law of nature by, by any stretch. So we have been questioning that and seeing if it's the type of paradigm that eventually really changed, that uh, is not sufficiently justified. Um, and if it were to be justified, then we would be okay with that, right? If somebody were to say, well, here is why this makes sense. Decisions that are affecting all of us will be made by a small group of us. And as Marjorie was looking at it, she said, well, this is very akin to aristocracy, right? And uh, to the way in which decisions were made in medieval and post-medieval England, where a certain number of people would get to vote just because they were the ones that owned the land. 
and it wasn't questioned until it was. So I start from the standpoint that it is possible to change this, and change is coming. The moment is now to have this conversation with the rising wave of populism. This is, uh, uh, this is increasing. And I want to think of it specifically from one angle, that is the increased role of the corporation in our life. Right? We're no longer talking about something that is fundamentally private, and you say, okay, the ones that started it or put the capital in get to make the decisions. This is something that will affect uh, all of us more broadly. Right? If Apple has a trillion dollar market cap, right, they're way bigger than a lot of countries in the world, and why is it just invested as shareholders in Apple get to make those, uh, those decisions? So we want to explore a little bit the why, of the need to reconceive ownership, but also some of the models that have come up, because this is not an abstract question, right? There are ways in which we can start thinking differently about governance, thinking differently about who gets the value, right? That you invest capital at the beginning, and by and large, you keep on reaping the benefits of that in perpetuity, regardless of your not having put any more um, effort beyond the initial effort or the initial risk. What is your version, what's the story that you have in your head about this arc, the evolution of what civic tech even is? Yeah. Where are we at right now? Where's it going? It is my opinion that if you say we're going to host a hackathon, I think that's really wonderful for the community. I think that it gets people really energized. It creates some great ideas about where so, like, certain pain points are and things that we should be focusing are. A hackathon, for example, is not going to fix how immigration benefits work, how in the immigration application benefits work, right? It's a huge paper process. Uh, there are a ton of people who adjudicate these applications every day. They had a system that allowed people to apply electronically, and then when adjudicators received it, they printed it out to review it. Is and that why they would... you put system in quotation marks? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so these are things that are, they're not separate. It is core to how these organizations do their work. Where I am at now, where our team is thinking about this work, it's in my mind sort of it has evolved from the hackathons and open data and into the how are you doing your work? What is painful about it? What can we make better about it? Because if you are more efficient, you will be more effective in carrying out your core critical missions, and that is what we need right now. Family planning is an important key to unlocking the sustainable development goals. In September 2015, the United Nations launched its sustainable development goals. Targets 3.7 and 5.6 address sexual and reproductive health and rights, including family planning. Most people know that family planning is essential to women's health, but the benefits of family planning go far beyond health. Family planning is vital to the achievement of all 17 goals. Let's connect the dots. Some goals focus on ending poverty and promoting economic growth. How does access to contraception help? Enabling women and girls to plan their pregnancies lowers health care costs, keeps more girls in school, and helps more women enter and stay in the workforce. When women are more able to contribute to or manage household income, they spend more than men do on food, health, clothing, and education for their children. This helps economies and families. Several goals focus on equity in health and education between genders, within countries, and among countries. Full-scale development is based on three fundamental pillars. First, the satisfaction of fundamental human needs, <clears throat> the generation of growing levels of self-reliance at local and at national levels, and an organic articulation between people, nature, and technology. And we propose to classify needs according to two criteria. First, an ontological or existential criteria, the needs of being, having, the needs of doing, and the needs of interacting. And, through an axiological or value uh, vision, the nine, what we call the nine fundamental human needs. Protection, affection, or love, understanding, 
participation, idleness, creation, identity, freedom, subsistence. If we have these two ways of classifying that, this gives origin to a very interesting matrix, which we call the needs matrix. In this matrix, there, is, there are no objects, there is nothing material in here. So when we speak about having, it's not having objects, it's having principles, values, laws, rules, traditions. The purpose of any economy, of any policy, the fundamental purpose is Global warming has been in the public sphere for more than 40 years. Our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. That's the problem statement. But is it game over? Or are there solutions to address this? No one has mapped out concrete solutions to reverse global warming. Well, until now. The term drawdown establishes a goal that was basically missing from climate change discussions. Drawdown research fellows with the help of 120 advisors, they came up with 100 solutions that are in hand and practical to reverse global warming. What did they do? They did the math. They ranked all these solutions based on overall carbon dioxide equivalent arrested in gigatons until 2050 in a conservative scenario. They figured out what could be the cost for the next 30 years and the net savings. And all this data is based on peer-reviewed research. Let's see some of the drawdown solutions. Afforestation. Creating new forests where there were none before is the aim of afforestation. It is ranked number 15 out of 100 with a potential savings of $392 billion. The wind industry is marked by a rapid increase in number of turbines, dropping costs and heightened performance. In many areas, wind is either competitive with or less expensive than coal generated electricity. Onshore wind turbine is the number two solution and offshore wind turbine is number 22 on the list. Combined together, they become the number one solution to reverse global warming. One third of the food raised or prepared does not make it from farm or factory to fork. The food we waste is responsible for roughly 8% of global emissions. There are a number of ways to address this issue. Plant-rich diets reduce emissions and also tend to be healthier, leading to a lower rates of chronic diseases. Education lays the foundation for vibrant lives for girls and women, their families and their communities. It also is one of the most powerful available for avoiding emissions by curbing population growth. Women with more years of education have fewer and healthier children and actively manage their reproductive health. Indigenous Communities they have long been the front line of resistance against deforestation, mineral, oil and gas extraction and the expansion of monocrop plantations. Their resistance prevents land-based carbon emissions and maintains or increases carbon sequestration.